50 years ago, humans left their earthly bonds and stepped foot on another celestial body. I wasn't alive at the time, so I've had to rely on the accounts of others of what it was like to be part of such a momentous occasion. And so on the 20th of July, 1969, millions of people around the world united to join Neil and Buzz as they descended towards the surface of the moon. Children were allowed to stay up late to follow the painstaking progress of the mission, but they were in luck because the astronauts themselves couldn't sleep, and so the moonwalk was brought forward. And after a patient wait, the world listened to Neil Armstrong as he uttered those famous first words as he stepped foot onto the moon. Humankind has achieved remarkable things throughout history, but none had ever witnessed their home world rise above the horizon of another planetary body. And although the space race was fueled by Cold War competition, ultimately it led to pride in humanity and the unity of our species. Since the Apollo era, humans haven't made it beyond Earth orbit, but there's been immense progress in the development of the technologies that we need for long-term space exploration. In this talk, I'm going to explain how we plan to use water, our life-giving resource, to enable such long-term missions, and how we plan to harvest water off of planet Earth, so that whatever the future lies for us here on our home planet, as an interplanetary species, we will thrive. My story in the field of space exploration began in 2007. I was 15 years old and lucky enough to be in Florida to witness the Space Shuttle Endeavour as it launched on its way to the International Space Station and captained by astronaut Scott Kelly. I'd always been a keen scientist, but watching astronauts strapped atop a rocket and launching into space was something I'd only ever seen in the movies, but this was a reality. It was a reality that I wanted to be a part of. Fast forward eight years later, and I was teaching physics to high school students, and I would take any opportunity to talk about space with the kids. I once cut a science test short so we could go watch the solar eclipse, and I would take any opportunity. At the end of every term, we would watch some sort of space-themed movie, usually Apollo 13, my personal favorite. Later that year, I was lucky enough to begin my master's in the field of space exploration systems to see if I could turn my dreams into a reality of working in the space sector. That same year, astronaut Scott Kelly, the same astronaut I witnessed those few years earlier, was beginning his year-long mission on the International Space Station, the results of which will be used to help support astronauts to survive long-term space exploration missions, say, to Mars. Whilst on the space station, Scott would have benefited from water recycling technologies that would take wastewater and humidity from the space station and recycle it for use. That does mean that the water would have made its way through his crewmates and any onboard lab animals multiple times before it made its way to Scott, and that might sound kind of gross, but ultimately, the water they're drinking on the space station is far cleaner than most of the water we drink here on Earth. Thinking back to the Apollo era, they would have relied on fuel cells to generate their precious water, and for the two crew members who would head down to the surface of the moon, they would have tanks of water that would keep them alive for a few days. But thanks to modern-day water recycling technologies, the biggest drain on water when it does come to space exploration isn't the life support needs of humans, it's actually rockets. So rockets are powered by combustion or fire. And the most common rocket propellants out there are hydrogen and oxygen, which are conveniently the ingredients of water. Now, although hydrogen and oxygen are some of the cleanest propellants out there, like any rocket propellant, once you use it, it's gone. Now, think back to the Saturn V, the rocket that took humans to the moon. It would have taken around an Olympic-sized swimming pool's worth of hydrogen and oxygen simply to get the rocket out of Earth's gravity. You might also have noticed that rockets just before launch, they look like they're venting gases or there's some frozen ice on the side. And that's because they are kept at extremely cold temperatures so that the hydrogen and oxygen is kept in liquid form. This is so that it takes up as little space as possible. So this is the product of downsizing. Now imagine, instead of just three crew members, you've got a larger crew, infrastructure, supplies, more propellant for your onward journey, say, to Mars, and suddenly the size and number of rockets that you're going to need grows exponentially larger. One solution to this could be the idea of generating uh, the water and supplies and infrastructure you need from space so that you can launch your crew, meet with your supplies, and then continue on your journey. This is a concept I was introduced to in my master's, and it's called in situ resource utilization. It's the idea that you can produce and access the resources that you need from the space environment around you. For example, if you had access to water on the moon, you could not only support humans in a permanent lunar base, you could also produce propellant to, say, launch supplies from the surface of the moon. One of the benefits of this is that because the moon has a lot lower gravity than here on Earth, you can use much smaller rockets and much less propellant. 
This is exactly why we had the huge Saturn V to take us to the moon, but only the small lunar module to get us back home again. Now, the moon isn't exactly well known for its vast supplies of water. In fact, nowhere in the solar system is outside of Earth, and that's because Earth lies in what is known as the Goldilocks zone. That means it's not too hot and it's not too cold. It is just the right temperature because it is just the right distance from the sun that combined with having an atmosphere means that liquid water is stable on its surface and ultimately can lead to life. And although the moon is only three days away, albeit traveling at the speed of a bullet, because the moon has no atmosphere, there isn't liquid water stable on its surface. And the same applies to Mars, which would mean the idea of going for a leisurely swim or listening to the sound of rain on your window would be a distant memory for any future spacefaring citizen. So how do we turn the moon, <coughs> excuse me, the moon into this interplanetary pit stop? Well, although there might not be liquid water on its surface, there is recent evidence that's telling us that there's frozen water in the polar regions of the moon. And this is because in the polar regions, there are areas that never see sunlight. And so they are extremely dark and extremely cold. So for example, if say, a meteorite strikes the surface, bringing with it some water, most of that water will vaporize into space. But if some of those molecules strike a cold surface, they'll stick there. This is no different to say when you're taking a shower in the mornings and there's water vapor moving around the bathroom. If it strikes the cold window pane, it will stick there. Now imagine after millions of years, these water deposits have built up to something that we could potentially harvest. But what makes these areas so good at trapping water and makes them a technological nightmare in trying to access them because they are so dark and so cold? Also means if you want to explore other regions of the moon, you might not be able to access the water, the water that you need. So if you can't find the water that you need, what if you can make water from the rocks themselves? It might sound like magic, but it's actually just chemistry. The ingredients of water are everywhere, all over the moon. Hydrogen is the simplest form of, an, of a pro, uh, the simplest form of an atom. It's a proton. So the solar wind is made up of protons, and it's constantly bombarding the surface of the moon, which we could potentially harvest. Oxygen, meanwhile, is bound up in the mineral structure of rocks, and we just need energy to extract it from the rock. And this is where the mining industry comes in. The mining industry are experts at extracting precious materials from big chunks of rock. So together, the mining industry, international space agencies, academia, private space companies are coming together to develop the technologies that we need to help produce water, oxygen, and other precious materials from, say, the moon, Mars, and even asteroids. And the first step will be a demonstration. And that's what I'm working on today. So I'm finishing up my PhD studies, working on a relatively simple water production technique that we hope to use on the surface of the moon in around 2025. If successful, it could be one of, if not the first production of water ever on the moon. But we're already looking further ahead. There are teams who are building machines here on Earth that can produce liters of water from big chunks of rock. Then we just need to take those machines, bring them to the moon, and we can produce water that can not only support a permanent lunar base, that would open up the door to so much more science that we can do on the surface of the moon, not just three days of science and, and more rock collecting. We can actually answer questions such as the origins of the solar system. We can also use the moon as a way to test the technologies that we need to help us get to, say, Mars, and even the technologies we need once we're at Mars. Because the thing is, getting to Mars is hard. And by, we can test a lot of these technologies closer to home, only three days away, as opposed to six months away. Because those of you who say, seen or read The Martian, if something goes wrong on Mars, you can't simply phone home for help. There's a lot of uh, self-reliance uh, and utilization of resources that is going to be required. Someone I know actually believed The Martian was based on a true story. And although I laughed at first, you can see there is a change in mentality going on. There is a belief that, yes, we can go to Mars, and we can use the moon to help us to get there, as well as achieving incredible science along the way. And it's my goal in my career to try and make that happen and develop the tools that we need to enable long-term space exploration for our future spacefaring citizens. Thank you very much.